What's up guys? I'm Scurvy Dog. If you don't know me in the, you know, kind of amateur um league Dota communities. And um something that a lot of you don't know about me is that my uh background, my scholastic background is actually in uh just like group and team performance and group expertise development and all of that kind of through this lens and scope of industrial psychology. And my uh, graduate school research was actually on how to kind of maximize the performance of teams and specifically complex performance env environments. Um, but as far as the operational definition of what that is, Dota falls exactly in like Dota is a complex performance environment because the needs of the game are always changing. The needs of each person are always changing. There is this very, very oppressive element of time and pressure. And it really requires a group, you know, a group behaving synergistically to end, to win at the, you know, the end of the game. So with all these different elements, you know, regarding like the, the performance domain of Dota, uh, there are two main kind of branches that go into team performance. So obviously we have team performance, you know, right here above me. And there's actually kind of a branch off to the other side of team performance and that's just like the individual player skill like obviously the individual player skill what each player brings to the level as far as their mmr and dota skill affects team performance but i'm going to be talking about not what the skill of each player because we all have our teams all the leagues are kind of mid-season right now you can't really change and adapt your teams that much at this point you really have to just focus on like how can you maximize the group of five players that you already have so on the, you know this side of the uh, team performance, there are the things that go beyond just the individual skill. It's more of the social sphere of what goes into that, the actual like team performance. And there's two main pillars of this. That is the efficient information sharing, and that's a little more um, that, that's a little more like you know about the minutia, and it requires a little bit more like intentional, you know, explaining and training and whatnot. But then down below that is team cohesion. Team cohesion is a lot of just like the soft elements of like the social sphere that your team operates in. And the thing that regulates both of these things is going to be communication. So how your team communicates with each other, um, both in game and out of game is going to affect kind of the social sphere that your team lives and breathes in as well as directly affecting like how well you, um, your team is able to communicate the information that needs to be communicated to everyone. But like I said, this top part, the efficient information sharing, that's a little more complicated, a little more nuanced. I'm going to be focusing on team cohesion. And there are a lot of things that go into team cohesion, but team cohesion is essentially just how well the team likes each other, how well you work, you know, you operate and work together, how much each person enjoys playing, how much and, and, and how much identity each person finds within the team that you're currently playing on. And a big, big element of that is social safety. And I decided to talk about social safety here in my you know first video explaining this because social safety is at the, at the bottom where like I could tell talk to you about and you could learn about social safety and you could implement these different ideas and strategies um in how you interact and communicate with your team that will kind of get that first kind of you know you know cohesion boost um that's pretty um granular um that's tangible and that you can like implement whereas get, getting the more nuanced efficient information sharing like that's you know in 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 the kind of tree of complexity that's a lot more towards the top but social safety so I'm going to start this part off by giving a little anecdote, right? I am a Immortal 2000 player right now. Um, at the peak of my Dota, um, and I was really, really, you know, back, I'm really into it right now, but when I was really into it before, the maximum rank I ever got was around Immortal 1200. But I'm Immortal 2000 right now. I have, you know, a lot of hours in the game and everything, right? I'm a very veteran player of the game. And I joined this team, and it's important to note that, you know, I was on this team. This team picked me Jakiro. And Jakiro, I'm a Grandmaster, level 30 Jakiro player. I have 800 games at playing as Jakiro. I'm a veteran Dota player, but I know my Jakiro. Like, 
that is one of my favorite heroes. I know the limitations of it. I know what to do in most situations. I think playing 800 games as one hero kind of lends itself to that, and that goes without say. But I was in this, this league game, 82 all specifically, and my captain, he picks me Jakiro because he knows I like Jakiro. I'm a Grandmaster Jakiro. I'm a good Jakiro player, right? He picks me this because he knows I'm a good Jakiro player, right? And we're in the lane, we're laning and whatnot, and we're up against something completely cancers for a Jak Jakiro. I'm pretty sure I might have been up against like a Legion Commander Omni Knight, both with dispels, which kind of renders the strengths of Jakiro in lane kind of useless. Having um, two dispels, you know, hypothetically even potentially three three dispels, uh, depending on the patch, because before the Omni dispel only dispelled the selected target, but I'm getting nuanced here. Jakiro doesn't like spells. Dispels. I I'm, in I'm in lane with the guy. And in lane, I think by the time I got to be level four, my build, my skill build, my spell build, was one, two, one. One point in dual breath, two points in ice path, one point in liquid fire. Why did he do that? Because dual breath, liquid fire, kind of worthless, right? Thinking of the spells and how worthless a damage or a dispellable damage over time would be in lane. So that that's my build. And my carry, who is also the captain, happens to be the captain. Um not being a support player or Jakiro player, ping, ping, ping. scurvy dog. What are you doing? Ping, ping. Your 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 skill build. It sucks. Ping, ping. You do no damage. Ping, 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 ping. Ping, ping, ping. Two points in ice path. How are you supposed to kill them? Ping, ping. It is calling me out and basically saying my item build on Jakiro sucks because you always max dual breath for damage to get kills and whatnot. And think about how frustrating that is for me. Me going in this game with the full drive and intention to win, to do my best, to play the specific lane matchup, but just to play the game holistically to the best of my ability as possible, right? So there's that that element. So consolidate these three points into one point. The fact that he picked me Jakiro because he wanted me to play a hero that I'm good at, right? So he picked me this hero because he was he supposed to, he you know he recognized that I'm good at it and like I'm going into this invested wanting the best for my team and I'm doing this with all the all the right intentions and I have this captain who's not a support doesn't play Jakiro all of a sudden telling me what I'm doing is wrong I need to be doing something different for reasons that are just completely irrelevant and just frankly wrong and I was so frustrated, like, I didn't even want to try anymore, because, like, my intentions, whether he agreed or not, were the right intentions. He completely just disemboweled um, my experience playing Jakiro and my judgment on what's best in the situation. So, you know, kind of explaining those th through those two points, all of a sudden I realized this guy doesn't trust me at all. Not really, like butchered my motivation to try and to you know continue to, to play at my best because why do I want to why, why do I want to perform and do my best for this captain that's scrutinizing me over things that he literally doesn't know what he's talking about so that's kind of my anecdote when it comes to social safety because after that experience like and, and you know from really then on um and obviously there there's a lot more elements to that beyond just a laning phase where I was always criticized for like how I played team fights, um, my positioning on the map. Like I always did everything wrong. Everything, you know, everything I did was wrong. And there's just no trust or, you know, inquiry inquiries on like why I was doing what I was doing. Instead of like asking like, hey, why do you die there? Why are we positioning, you know, at that spot on the map? It's just, you know, ping ping, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Do this, do this, do that. Because he just the captain just felt like he had the most authoritative, correct perspective on every position and everything that's going on in the game. Very frustrating. But an attitude and perspective that is very, very disruptive to, a, you know, team social safety because it really goes against everything that social safety is. 
So social safety essentially is like when team members, you know, feel safe and secure. Like they feel so somebody will feel socially safe within their team when they feel like their thoughts and perspectives are validated when they are trusted by the team and when they trust their teammates and kind of when this happens, they will kind of, you know, communicate more openly. They're, they're, they will share their opinions and ideas, even when they might be potentially like controversial in nature. And they'll also kind of collaborate uh, more efficiently, both in the nonverbal and verbal sphere, um, verbal sphere. Um, because like, you know, when there's kind of some discourse going on about kind of like, you know, when there's downtime in the game, there's discourse like, okay, you know, they feel a lot stronger than us. We can't really, we might not be able to kill, you know, important heroes on their team. Like, where do we position? Who do we target? Stuff like that. You know, can be communicated with, like when there's da when there's downtime. But there's also a lot of nonverbal communication elements in Dota. Um, things that kind of have to be read off the body language regarding like the avatars within the game. And when someone is feeling socially safe, they can collaborate better both in that, like I said, the verbal sphere and that nonverbal sphere where there's a lot of, you know, kind of interaction and communication, communication, communication uh, that goes on and kind of this like team inf information bubble that everyone is kind of tapping into and, you know, putting information in and taking in in information out of it. Um, but even beyond that, people who feel socially safe will just be motivated to perform their best and also enjoy the experience more. Um, however, on the flip side of that, when someone does not feel socially safe, it honestly detracts from both the enjoyment of playing as well as on the overall just like team performance because once that once one person kind of taps out and doesn't want to kind of engage in the team in that positive way anymore, all of a sudden, instead of five people kind of putting information up in that kind of, you know, team social communication bubble there's now only four instead of five so as a player that's disengaged when i see some critical information like let's say i see the bkb get dropped off on the courier right i you know if i was invested ping ping hey phantom assassin has a bkb that's very important for the team to know if I'm tapped out, I don't care anymore. I might see that, meh, whatever, I don't care. All of a sudden, that bit of information isn't getting dispersed to the rest of the team. So it could be, you know, it's the fact that people no longer kind of want to kind of collaborate in both like kind of the social, both in the verbal and kind of like nonverbal sphere of things. And it also just kind of broods, um, res you know, resentment. Um, it will de decrease their own individual performance outside of the team perspective. Their own individual performance will go down. And once you have those two, those two layers of both the, their own personal performance going down, all of a sudden the team sphere, the team performance going down, you can really see how just one person disengaged can be very detrimental for a team. So here's the part of the video um, that's, kind of like the granular, granular tangible tidbits and the fact why I chose to kind of start with social safety as something that, you know, to, to kind of focus on in the first video, because like from here, things will kind of potentially have to be more intentional, right? And a lot of these elements of social safety you can do just by like leading by example or by setting clear and concise kind of boundaries and expectations with your team. So the first thing is, is to encourage open and honest communication and this is very, very important to both encourage it, encourage people to share their perspectives. If you're draft, if you're drafting and you have this, what you think is a brilliant idea for a pick and one of your teammates is like, Hey, that's not a good idea. Like you want to encourage that, encourage that honest and open, you know, communication, but also as a responsibility for you and the responsibility that, that you give the others on your team, make sure that you listen to that and do not ignore that because what might be worse than just not saying anything what might be worse is saying hey i want you guys to be open and honest and potentially controversial if i'm saying something crazy tell me right if you say that if you tell your team to have that degree of trust and communication with you and your response to that is you ignore them or say they're wrong that's worse than just not saying anything so the first thing is encourage this open and honest communication but also 
be willing to listen and have dialogue and have the comments that what you know people have comments that go against what you say and when that happens listen to it and use that to to have you know communication and question and have you know this discourse around you know kind of where your perspectives the second thing is to kind of foster trust for each other's um performance right you know have the conversation with your team like hey guys understand that and this is especially the case for leagues like rd2l because like in 82l if you're like you know in any, any of the divisions in 82l there's a lot of divisions right the actual skill gaps between players are going to be rather squished. In RD2L, you can have immortal 100 players and Guardian players on the same team. So this is even more important for like RD2L, but just make, you know, have the conversation and make sure people realize that everyone is doing their best. If someone is legitimately doing it, doing their best, giving it their best shot, and whether their perspective is right or wrong, it might, it might be wrong, but as long as they're doing it in good faith and good intention, they feel like th what they're doing is the best thing to do. Like, trust that people are trying their best, right? I think when people recognize that everyone on the team, you know, once everyone on the team trusts that everyone is doing their best, there, there'll be a lot less toxicity. But that's also the kind of the dangerous flip side of this is like, if you were to have this conversation about everyone's trying their best, um, let's trust each other, right? And whether you as the captain or someone on our team starts like yelling and being toxic, that almost makes it worse than just not saying anything at all. But a big portion of this social safety is recognizing people are trying their best. People are doing ev everything that they do in good faith, what they feel like is the best thing in the moment. And it's very important to like recognize that. And when someone fails or does something bad, to lift them up in the moment and if there is room for some criticism or for some development leave that for after the game you can have conversations like that after the game if you try and correct bad behavior or bad perspectives within the intensity of like the duration of a game itself that is not the time to do it. and that is kind of like toxic in and out of itself to feel compelled to address it right then and there so and the last thing that I could give as like a direct thing that you that you can do with your team right now is to show appreciation. If you recognize that someone on your on your team popped off and played well above their skill their skill level, celebrate that, right? Whether you feel comfortable kind of like celebrating with your team kind of like after a specific play or you know even better like after a game. Acknowledge when people play well, but also acknowledge people when they don't play well and this is you know like i said probably best done after a game so let's say someone pops off plays well above their skill level they're a crusader but they tangibly played like an ancient like they went crazy right if you're the captain after the game open up discord and open a dm and say hey like i you know even if y'all discuss it you know even if your team discuss it after the game be like hey i just want to say that you popped off like you did X, Y, and Z, very specific behaviors that they did, specific actions they did that were really good, X, Y, Z. And it could be actions and behaviors in game, but it, it, it could also just be how they communicate and how they communicated with the team. Did they do things that built that element of social safety within the team, right? So when we look at team performance, there's both that individual skill and that kind of social, you know, dimensions both affecting that actual team performance whether someone popped off and did great on the social side or over here on the skill side acknowledge that so like i said whatever whether it's both or it's one of the dimensions that they tapped into and just went crazy on shoot them a dm you'll be like yo you did x y and z specific behaviors great you did so good you popped off like it was really really awesome to see you do you know do so do so great And by essentially by doing these specific tangible things that I just um, elucidated, all of a sudden you are kind of fostering that trust and planting the seeds of social safety by kind of planting these expectations um, and norms within your team. 
and you're also leading by example on kind of the you know those expectations that uh, that uh, that you're setting. 